welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting uh, today. And in the next two sessions, we should be discussing dependence of random variables and conditional distributions. Uh, today, the session will be actually quite technical. Uh, I would like to explain properly uh, this concept of uh, expectations like a general definition of expectations. We did talk about that a little bit before, but uh, the definitions that we used were actually limited just to uh, discrete random variables and continuous random variables. Uh, today, I will attempt to create or like uh, to, define, uh, to define expectations in a very general way. It will take some time, but uh, the, the payoff is good because uh, we will be able uh, from then on uh, use expectations uh, without specifying what kind of random variable we are using. And uh, what we will discuss is uh, also connected to this concept of measures. So at the end of the meeting, uh, I would like to discuss measures, uh, counting measure, Lebesgue measure and stuff like that. Uh, and this will allow us to uh, talk about more general notion of uh, distribution functions and uh, related matters. Um, yeah, if you find today's meeting a little bit too technical, uh, sorry about that. Um, you don't necessarily need to understand all of these details to just get started with statistics. Uh, but I think it makes sense for me to cover this uh, so that later on our life is easier and we can talk about um, theorems that are fairly general uh, without necessarily restricting our attention to discrete random variables or continuous uh, random variables. Um, and um, yeah, so first uh, let's discuss expectations. Previously, in the previous two sessions, we talked about moments of distributions and uh, yeah, expectation really is one of the moments. Um, and we also defined the other moments in terms of expectations. Uh, so yeah, previously I did talk about these definitions. I will uh, remind you a little bit of that. And uh, uh, specifically, um, yeah, I provided these kind of definitions of expectation of a random variable. I had uh, one version of the expectation definition for uh, discrete random variables. So there we would take individual values that the random variable can take. We would multiply that by probabilities and then we would sum it up over all of the possible values that the random variable can take. So this was a weighted average of the values that the random variable can take where the weights are specified by the probabilities of the individual values. So this was uh, our definition of expectation for discrete random variables. And uh, yeah, we had another version of the definition uh, which would be applicable to continuous random variables. So in that case, we take these possible values X, we multiply them by the probability density function P, and then we integrate it over all possible values. And yeah, uh, we are going to uh, define expectation in this way. And uh, yeah, as you see, we have one concept here and we have it defined in two different ways uh, for different types of random variables. Uh, that's a bit inconvenient. So today I will provide a general definition and uh, yeah, hopefully I will be able to break down this definition into relatively easy steps that are easy to follow. Have some visualizations related to that. Uh, but uh, if any, at any point things are unclear, let me know. Uh, yeah, maybe before we get there, let me also emphasize that the existence of expectations is not guaranteed. Uh, sometimes the expectations just don't exist. And I provided this example of the Cauchy distribution that just does not have an expectation defined. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so our goal here would be to come up with a definition or to present a definition uh, that's good enough for all random variables. Uh, so this will be the general definition of expectations in here. Now, unfortunately, it takes a little bit of time. So uh, sorry about that. I broke uh, the, whole, um, the, the whole definition into four steps. And 
if at any point you find it counterintuitive or if at any point it is not clear what, what's the meaning of the symbols, let me know. I'm definitely happy to elaborate on that. And um, yeah, what are we going to do? So uh, we are going to define expectations for uh, so-called indicator random variables. After that, uh, we will define expectations for uh, so-called uh, simple random variables. So these will be linear combinations of the indicator random variables. After that, uh, we will be able to uh, go on and to define expectations for arbitrary non-negative random variables. And finally, we will have this general definition uh, for any random variable that can take positive values, negative val uh, values, uh, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, let, let's take a look at that. If I... And uh, yeah, by the way, so at the, at the beginning here, it may not be actually clear why we are doing this. Um, some of these variables may sound a little bit too simple for us to be worth uh, investigating their properties. Uh, but uh, in the end, we will use all of this to build our general definition. And uh, yeah, once we have that, uh, it will be easy for us to talk about uh, theorems in statistics that have uh, general applicability. And uh, uh, yeah, so I have uh, actually two pictures in here what uh, an indicator random variable would mean. Although, yeah, maybe before that, let me read this out. Uh, we will be defining an indicator random variable denoted IA for any uh, reasonable event A. And uh, yeah, if you have this event A, uh, you can say that if you, um, yeah, if the outcome, uh, so the outcome was uh, some element of the sample space, you hopefully remember, uh, if the outcome belongs to this event, so in other words, if the event happens, uh, then the value of this indicator random variable is going to be equal to one. If the outcome is not an element of the event, then uh, the, the value of the indicator variable is going to be uh, zero. So uh, really, uh, this variable indicates whether or not the event actually happened. Uh, yeah, I do have some pictures here. Um, yeah, this uh, visualization here shows actually two different indicator uh, random variables. And specifically, uh, when I plotted this, what I had in mind was uh, having a horizontal axis uh, corresponds to omega. So I imagine here that the sample space is just a real line. So the different omegas are going to be different real numbers. And then for each one of them, we can specify the functional value of this indicator and number variable. And I have one blue one and one beige one. Uh, so the blue indicator random variable that you see here is an indicator of this particular interval right here. So if the outcome omega belongs here, belongs to this interval, uh, then the value of this indicator random variable is uh, equal to one. And if you are outside of that, uh, then the value of the indicator variable is uh, just zero. And similarly for the Beige function, uh, yeah, the Beige function is uh, equal to zero everywhere, except for this interval right here. And uh, yeah, if omega belongs to this interval, uh, then the value of the indicator random variable uh, is this. And of course, uh, if you decide to change the interval, uh, then the shape of the function is going to change. Um, yeah, hopefully also remember the fact that random variables in probability theory are defined as functions of the outcomes, right? So uh, here uh, we have functions of omega, which belongs to the real line. So that's uh, one visualization. I have one more. So the event can be more complicated. So the event can be, say, two intervals, and that's plotted here. Uh, this is just one indicator random variable corresponding to a single event uh, which consists of two intervals. So specifically, 
uh, we have uh, one interval here, uh, one interval here. If omega belongs to one of these, uh, then the functional value of this indicator random variable is uh, going to be equal to one. Uh, and of course, yeah, you, you can kind of decide uh, what is going to be the exact uh, interval right here. Uh, so yeah, uh, any questions at this moment? So uh, it's supposed to be simple, but uh, is, uh, is this clear? Uh, then, if there are no questions, uh, let's go, go ahead and define expectation for these indicator random variables. And uh, I have the definition uh, written right here, but uh, I may need to elaborate on it in a second. So uh, we say that uh, the expectation of this indicator random variable is uh, simply the probability that the outcome omega belongs to the event A. Uh, which is uh, P of A. And uh, you may remember this is our notation for the probability measure. We are implicitly working uh, with some probability space and there is some probability measure. So uh, this, event uh, th this event A has a certain uh, probability that we call P of A. Now, why would we define it this way? Uh, the reasoning is actually relatively simple. So if you think about it, um, we get a number of one as a functional value of this indicator variable uh, with probability p of a, right? And then we get uh, we get zero uh, with probability one minus p of a. So on average, the value that we get on average is simply uh, p of a, and that's why we use that as our definition of the expected value of uh, the indicator random variable. And yeah, here I may want to also uh, remind you that uh, I'm going to use expectation and uh, expected value interchangeably. Uh, expectation is supposed to be short for expected value. Uh, so that's our first step in our definition. Um, yeah, do we have any questions? Is, is this all clear? Is the notation clear? It's supposed to be simple, but uh, if you get lost in the notation, things will be pretty hard later on. All right, so, so hopefully everyone is comfortable with this. So let's go one step further and uh, let's think about a linear combination of, sim of uh, indicator variables. So this is something that we will call simple random variable. And uh, yeah, I'm getting a question. Uh, PR and P mean the same we uh, mean the same thing. Yeah, let, let me get back here. So you are talking about this equation right here. Um, it is the same object, but um, just like different way of expressing the same idea. Uh, the most fundamental thing here is the uh, probability measure. Uh, so you may remember that for all events in our event space, uh, we will have this probability measure defined so we can say what is the probability of an event. And uh, this notation in the middle, that's uh, it's like a helpful notation. It's uh, maybe more intuitive to understand what this means. Uh, PR stands for probability. And here we specify uh, this like logical statement that uh, omega belongs to A. Uh, but uh, really what we mean by the symbols in the middle is actually precisely uh, this probability measure applied to the event A. Uh, so uh, thanks for the question. And uh, yeah, another uh, comment here. If you could give an example from real life, it would be more intuitive. Um, yeah, so, so uh, this is uh, still random variables without too much structure. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's say, uh, let's say that uh, event A uh, specifies that uh, it's going to rain tomorrow, uh, maybe in Tokyo, okay? Uh, so if, if it does rain tomorrow in Tokyo, then event A happened. If it does not uh, rain tomorrow in Tokyo, event A does not, uh, did not happen. And uh, yeah, in the case of rain, the value of the corresponding indicator variable is going to be one. 
And in the case of no rain, the value of the indicator variable is going to be zero. So uh, it's supposed to be as simple as this. Uh, we basically translate whether or not an event happened into uh, zeros and ones. And on average, we are going to get a value that is uh, actually the probability of rain, right? So the expected value of this random variable is the probability that it's going to rain. And uh, uh, yeah, so another question, uh, what would be omega in this example? And uh, yeah, in the pictures that I had, omega was just one real number, right? Uh, but uh, in this particular case, uh, probably you want to think about something pretty complex. Uh, maybe uh, omega measures here the state of the atmosphere anywhere in the world or uh, corresponds to the state of the atmosphere in Tokyo specifically. And uh, then you translate kind of this physics concept into just one indicator whether or not it rain. Of course, uh, you would have to have some precise definition. If uh, you have just one drop falling from the sky, it's not going to be considered rain. Uh, but uh, yeah, omega could be the meteorological variables, uh, could be many of them. And then you would say whether or not uh, rain happened uh, based on this particular omega. Uh, Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the questions. It's going to be pretty abstract today, so it's great that you asked about this. Hopefully it's a little bit clearer now. Um, now let's, uh, let's look at the so-called simple random variables. Uh, simple may not be actually like a really good term in here, but yeah, pe people often call it simple random variables. They can be pretty complex, actually, uh, depending on the events that you consider. But uh, yeah, these uh, random variables are going to be simple in the sense that they are just going to be finite linear combinations of indicator variables. So uh, right here, I have a definition of a simple random variable. Um, yeah, what you see on the right hand side is some finite sum of indicator variables corresponding to different events multiplied by some weights alpha i. And these can be positive or they can be negative. It's up to you what values alpha i you choose here. So when you sum this all up, uh, you will have your simple random variable. And the notation that I have here is uh, xs with s indicating simple. Uh, let's take a look at some visualization. Uh, so uh, what you see here is a visualization of a simple random variable. Uh, but I will have to explain what is what. Uh, so uh, we have here two different events. Uh, we have a blue event and we have a red event. And uh, the blue event in this visualization uh, corresponds to this particular interval. So if omega belongs to this interval, uh, then the value of the, of the blue indicator variable is going to be one. And anywhere else, uh, the value of this indicator variable is going to be zero. Uh, similarly, uh, we have this uh, red uh, indicator variable. It corresponds to this interval right here. So if omega falls in there, the value of this indicator variable is going to be one. And uh, anywhere else, the value of this indicator variable is going to be simply zero. So these are our uh, indicator random variables. And then uh, using these two, uh, we can define a simple random variable that's the green one. Uh, we can adjust the weights. So uh, yeah, in this visualization, I have parameters alpha one and alpha two. Uh, they are going to control the weights associated uh, with these two indicator uh, random variable. So if I uh, make alpha one smaller or even negative, uh, then uh, you see in this portion of the visualization, the value of the green function, the value of the simple function uh, went down. And uh, yeah, similarly for the other one, if I change alpha two, uh, then in the other interval, the value of the green function is going to go down. Uh, but yeah, in general, the green function 
is going to be the simple random variable that we are talking about right now. If you are outside of the two intervals, then the value of the simple random variable is simply zero. If the intervals are not overlapping, then the value of the simple random variable here is going to be alpha one, and here it's going to be alpha two. And uh, yeah, I'm getting a question. Uh, do we require the indicator random variables to be independent in the linear combination? And uh, yeah, so uh, this, uh, yeah, these events do not have to be uh, do not have to be independent, and uh, yeah, they can have overlap, and so on and so on. So yeah, I'm going to show you a different version of the picture. So I can change the size of the intervals, and I may need to adjust the weights a little bit here as well. Uh, so in this particular case. I have an overlap between the two intervals, right? So there's uh, an overlap between the two events. Uh, the event, yeah, the first event, the, the blue event, corresponds to this interval right here. And the second event corresponds to this interval right here. So the intervals have an overlap. And uh, if they have an overlap, then the functional value of this uh, simple random variable is going to be the sum. So, so the value right here is actually alpha one plus uh, alpha two. Uh, all right, so, so that's the concept of a simple random variable. Now we should uh, go ahead and define expectation of this. Uh, we should go ahead and define expectation of this uh, green function, the, the simple random variable. Uh, but uh, before I go to the formulas, uh, please tell me if you have any question about this visualization or about the concept and, and stuff like that. Okay, se seems fine. Then let me switch back here. And one thing that uh, we should keep in mind is that the concept of expectations should be linear. It should be kind of a linear operation uh, if you have a sum of two random variables and they have expectations, uh, then the expectation of the sum uh, should be the sum of expectations. And similarly, if you take one random variable and you multiply it by some number, then the, the value of the expectations should, uh, should change by the exact uh, same factor. So if you double the size of the random variable, uh, the expectation should be twice as big, assuming again that it exists. So it's a linear operation, and uh, we are going to use this principle uh, to extend the definition of expectation uh, to these uh, simple random variables. Uh, yeah, by the way, uh, I have uh, like a different way of writing uh, this uh, same formula. Yeah, maybe this one is simpler. Uh, it's really just uh, alphas multiplying the indicator random variables, and then it's all summed up. Uh, so uh, using this principle that the expectation should be a linear concept, uh, we are going to define the expectation of the simple random variable as the following sum. So we will have a summation here over the different events included in our linear combination. And we are going to sum alpha i times the expected value uh, of the indicator variable i in this particular case. And the expected value of the indicator variable, that was just the probability of that particular event. So our definition ends up being uh, yeah, that uh, the expectation of the simple random variable is this particular sum where we have the weights alpha i multiplied by the probabilities of the individual events. And uh, yeah, I again wrote this uh, particular sum in a more intuitive way uh, in here. Again, alpha is multiplying the probabilities and then it's all summed up. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I guess it's not terribly complicated, but uh, if you have questions, especially about the notation, uh, let me know.
But at this moment, uh, we have specified what expectation means uh, for all of these different simple random variables. All right, uh, yeah, looks like uh, no questions. Then let me go to this third step. Maybe the third step is actually most complicated in this particular definition. And I have some visualization in here. And uh, I will also need to remind you of some concepts. Uh, so specifically, infimum and minimum and supremum and maximum. Yeah, so let me think how to approach this. So, so maybe first I should talk about these concepts of infimum, minimum, supremum, and maximum. Uh, it's not a really something that I want to focus on today, uh, but uh, maybe not everyone is actually familiar with these concepts. So it's something that we will need in a second. So why don't I just explain that here? Uh, yeah, if you have some set of real numbers, so you may want to define these four concepts uh, for that particular set. Uh, let's start with uh, the infimum. So the infimum of a particular set is uh, supposed to be the largest number that is still smaller or equal to any element of the set. So it may sound a little bit cumbersome, but uh, uh, here is an example. So let's say that the set that we are thinking about is from is an interval from minus 3 to 2, and it's a closed interval. So the, the boundary values here are included in this set. Then uh, the infimum of this set is uh, simply minus 3. Uh, why? Uh, well, because minus 3 is the largest number uh, such that it's still smaller or equal to any element of this set. And uh, if you have an open interval like this, uh, where the boundary values are not included, the infimum is actually the exact same thing. So uh, we are going to get minus 3 in here, because again, uh, minus 3 is the, is the largest value that is smaller or equal to any element uh, of this particular set. So in other words, uh, you can think of the infimum as the largest lower bound on the values that have that are included in the set. Uh, yeah, any questions about this? So sometimes people get confused. So let me know if it's not clear. And uh, yeah, let me compare it to a minimum. So minimum obviously is a concept that's uh, much more frequently used, or maybe people are much more familiar with it. Uh, so. Okay, yeah, let, let me see the chat. Yeah, the comment is, uh, so the infimum of the second one should be, uh, well, a long number that you wrote here, but yeah, the number that you wrote here is actually equal to minus three. So uh, I think we are here in agreement. Uh, the, the infimum of this particular, uh, this particular set is minus three. And yeah, as for minimum, so the minimum is supposed to be an element of the set. Uh, the minimum is an element that is smaller or equal to any other element of the set. And uh, if you have a closed interval, the minimum in here is going to be minus 3 if the interval goes from minus 3 to 2. Uh, but uh, if you think about the open interval from minus 3 to plus 2, the minimum doesn't exist because you cannot possibly come up with a number that belongs to this interval and still is smaller or equal to any other number uh, inside that interval. And uh, then, uh, yeah, question. So infimum and minimum should be equal for a closed set in all cases. And uh, yeah, that's right. So if the minimum exists, it will be equal to the infimum. And if the, if the minimum doesn't exist, uh, the infimum still is going to exist. Uh, well, the infimum can be, can be a real number or the infimum can be also minus infinity. So if you have an interval that extends all the way to minus infinity, uh, the infimum in that case would be minus infinity. 
And uh, yeah, as for minimum, we will say the minimum doesn't exist. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you have uh, a set that does have a minimum, the minimum is going to be equal to the infimum. So I have two more concepts to introduce here, but uh, it's basically a symmetric situation, right? So uh, in particular, the supremum, uh, that's going to be the lowest upper bound on the elements of the set. So if you have this interval that we just considered, the supremum is going to be equal to two in both cases. And as for maximum, it's supposed to be an element that, it's supposed to be an element of the set. And uh, uh, yeah, sometimes it exists, sometimes it does not exist. Uh, for a closed interval, it will exist. And uh, yeah, the maximum here is going to be equal to two for our interval. If we have an open interval, the maximum is not going to exist. And again, if the maximum exists, it will be equal to supremum. So that's my discussion of these different concepts. Uh, question, uh, why can the minimum exist in the open set? And uh, yeah, the, the, the answer is that, yeah, anytime, anytime you give me a number, uh, that belongs to that set, I can come up with a number that's even smaller than that. Uh, it, yeah, so simply because the boundary value is not included. Uh, so I can just go slightly closer to the boundary value um, compared to the, to the number that you specified. Uh, all right, yeah, so uh, thanks for the questions. So this is something a little bit outside of the scope of uh, today's discussion, but I, I wanted to include this here because maybe people are not familiar with the concepts very well. Uh, hopefully it's clear at this moment. And uh, it is something that we will need. Uh, it is something that we will need to define the expectation of any positive or for any non-negative uh, random variable. And uh, yeah, specifically, we will start thinking about a random variable x that should be non-negative. So it can never take a negative value. And uh, we will think about uh, a simple uh, random variable xs that is always uh, smaller or equal to x. Now, there will be many of them, of course, but yeah, pick, pick one. So if you have uh, some simple random variable that's always smaller or equal to x, then it makes a lot of sense to define the expectation of x in such a way that it's going to be greater or equal uh, to the expectation of this uh, simple random variable xs. Right? So if, if xs is smaller uh, or equal, then its expectation should also be smaller or equal. So that's uh, one observation. And I have a picture here for clarity. So in this picture, uh, you see two different uh, random variables. Yeah, by the way, for the horizontal axis, I'm still using, uh, I'm still using the whole real line and the horizontal axis is supposed to indicate omega. Uh, that's our outcome. And the random variables, they are going to be functions of this outcome in here. Uh, I said there are two random variables in here. So one of them is the black one. So it's this uh, curve that you see uh, go going up and down and so on. So this is supposed to be X, capital X. And uh, I have uh, one more random variable. Uh, it's the green one. It's equal to zero here. Uh, it's equal to this value here and uh, this value here and so on. Uh, so this is supposed to be a simple random variable. Uh, you see it's a piecewise constant function in this particular case. So uh, yeah, uh, we can definitely think of it as a simple random variable. And uh, its plot is always below uh, the plot of the variable x. So in this particular case, uh, the black random variable x and the green random variable xs, uh, they satisfy the inequality that I was just uh, talking about. We have already defined expectation for the simpler random variables. So we do have 
a concept of expectation for the green function in here. Uh, we would like to uh, think about it in the context of defining expectation uh, for the black random variable. Um, and uh, yeah, so we would like to say that the expected value of capital X is going to be greater or equal uh, to the expected value of this simple random variable. So before I go back to the equations, uh, any questions about this picture? Is it all clear? Uh, all right, uh, then yeah, let's uh, uh, let's go back. Oh, sorry, uh, I need to go here. So given, given that uh, we would really want uh, the expected value of x to be greater or equal to the expected value of uh, the simple functions, it makes sense to define the expected value of x as a supremum. In particular, uh, we will be thinking about all possible simple functions that still lie below x. So we will think about all simple functions xx, xs, uh, that are smaller or equal to capital X. Then we think about the corresponding expectation of the simple random variable. And uh, for this uh, relatively big set, uh, relatively big set of numbers, uh, we are going to think about the supremum. Uh, that is the expected value is going to be defined as the supremum of this set of these uh, different expectations of the simple random variables. It's going to be the tightest upper bound on these expectations. And uh, yeah, if you think about it, uh, it should be fairly reasonable, right? So uh, with this kind of visualization, you can definitely think of some other random variables uh, that are still simple and uh, that lie below the plot of the uh, of the random variable x. So you can definitely imagine that uh, maybe instead of these values here, uh, the simple random variable is somewhere higher and so on and so on. So yeah, these uh, simple random variables, if you make them uh, structured enough, uh, can get very, very close to the actual plot of this uh, uh, random variable, uh, capital X. And uh, for that reason, it makes sense to define expected value of X as the supremum of the expected values of all of these possible green functions that uh, you can come up with. Uh, so that's kind of central, central, central part of the definition that I would like to present today. And uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, yeah, a question, what is the y-axis of this plot? Uh, and uh, yeah, so the y-axis here indicates the values of the random variables. So in particular, if we have uh, some value of omega, uh, let's say that omega is equal to minus two. So omega would be right here. If you look up the corresponding value of the black function, that's going to be x of omega. And uh, similarly, if you look up the corresponding value of the green function, uh, then that's going to be, oh, I should write it here, x of xs, as standing for simple, xs of omega. That is, I'm using the y-axis to plot the functional values of these different functions, of these different uh, random variables. So hopefully that uh, answers this question. And uh, then another question, uh, weights of the simple random variable are not represented in the picture. And uh, yeah, so that's true, um, I, I did not, show the weights explicitly in here. Uh, in fact, uh, there could be different ways of representing one simple random variable in terms of indicator random variables. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, what I did here, it was actually non-overlapping intervals when I was uh, creating this picture. 
uh, and in particular, I used uh, one simple function with uh, support here, uh, one simple function with support here, one simple function here, one simple function here, here and here. And uh, because I use non-overlapping intervals, the weights can be read off from this particular plot, right? So the, the weight corresponding to a particular interval would be simply the height of the cream function in here. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. And then uh, one, uh, one more comment here. Uh, could you please explain why the expected value is the supremum by drawing this plot? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so if we did not take the supremum, uh, if uh, you assume that if you, if you define the expected value of the random variable to be higher than the supremum, uh, then I would want to argue it would not match our intuition, right? Because um, yeah, in the case of uh, getting close to the supremum, uh, you will be considering simple functions that are actually pretty close to the black, uh, black curve in here. Uh, so yeah, maybe uh, this will be the functional values of the random variable here. Uh, this will be the functional values here. This will be the functional values here, here, here. Uh, yeah, ho hopefully you get the idea what I have in mind. So for this kind of simple random variable that I'm thinking about, you will have a very, very small discrepancy uh, between x and uh, xs. Uh, so when we are getting close to the supremum, when we are getting close to the uh, yeah, kind of the uh, lowest upper bound uh, on these expectations, the functional values of these simple functions are going to be actually pretty close to the functional values of the random variable x. And uh, yeah, for that reason, we uh, simply say that the expected value of capital X is the supremum. Um, now, we don't want to have a gap. So if, if you uh, said that maybe the expected value of X is going to be greater by one uh, compared to the supremum, uh, that would definitely not match our expectation because we will be having simple functions in here that are actually pretty close uh, to the shape of the uh, random variable capital X. Uh, okay, so, so hopefully uh, this is some additional clarification. And uh, one more uh, question here. Uh, sorry for missing this. Uh, why do we have X and XS? Oh, yeah, maybe that's something that I should have said earlier. Uh, it would be pretty hard for us to come up with a definition just on the spot without thinking about these uh, individual simple functions for the expected value of x. Um, or yeah, it would be hard to construct a definition that's powerful enough. And uh, our strategy here is to mm, like uh, make small steps. So first define the expectation for the indicator random variables. Uh, then uh, define expectations for the simpler random variables. Uh, those definitions were actually pretty straightforward. And then uh, we use the idea that uh, we can sort of approximate a random variable capital X uh, by these simple random variables. Uh, we don't yet have a definition of the expectation for capital X, but we do have a definition uh, for the simple random variables. Uh, so yeah, in that case, we basically are saying if the simple function is close enough uh, to the to the function x, uh, then the expectations will be close enough. So it's like a, basically an approximation argument, although we did not formulate it as an approximation. We just used this concept of supremum. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so great question. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. And I see that it's clear now. Um, then uh, another comment, 
Uh, I guess so with infinitely small width of the simple random variable components, it will be almost replica of the original function. Uh, function. And yeah, th that's exactly right, uh, except that, of course, we are not allowed to make it infinitely small um, because then it would not be a simple random variable. Uh, but of course, you can go to the limit, right? You can keep dividing these intervals and at any finite step, you will have just a finite number of intervals. Uh, and so on. Oh yeah, uh, by the way, so this doesn't have to be intervals. It can be substantially more complicated sets. And that's one reason why the definition is very powerful. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, if you think of it as intervals, it, it's just fine. Just uh, keep in mind that the sets, the particular events that we can consider here in constructing the simple random variables can be fairly wild, can be uh, pretty complicated events. And another comment, uh, it's a bit like Gaussian quadrature. Uh, uh, that's right, that's right. Uh, but uh, the connection here is because of the picture that I drew and, and I chose intervals. If I chose some crazy sets, uh, if I chose some fairly crazy events, it would not look like that. And uh, uh, yeah, so I would say the similarity with the Gaussian quadrature here is uh, because of the visualization that I created. Uh, but the definition itself is more powerful than that. Uh, all right, yeah, so, so uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the questions. So at this moment, we have a definition of uh, the expected value of a random variable. Uh, for any non-negative uh, random variable. Now let's go and make the final step in the definition. Uh, I see I'm not doing actually very well on time, but yeah, I hope you will not mind staying for a little bit longer today. Uh, so finally, finally, how do we how do we go from non-negative random variables to arbitrary random variables? Uh, the trick is going to be to take any random variable capital X and decompose it into two parts. So, so the first part is going to be called X plus and the second part is going to be called minus X minus. I have a picture for clarity in here. And uh, what you see in the picture is one random variable that uh, looks like this. Again, as a function of omega and again, I'm assuming omega is uh, just an element of the real line. So it's a function that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, then uh, you can split it into two pieces, right? Uh, you can uh, say that you define this green, uh, green function or green random variable. And the green random variable is going to be equal to the original random variable. Uh, wherever it's positive, and anywhere else it's going to be equal to zero. So that's the green part. Uh, I'm calling that x plus. Uh, then you can have this uh, red part. Uh, so the red part is equal to zero here, and it's going to be equal to the original random variable if you have negative values. We are going to call that minus x minus. And uh, in the plot, uh, I have uh, one more random variable in here. Uh, it's actually a flipped version of this minus x minus. That's something I'm going to call x minus. And it's the, it's the gray function in here. So it's going to be equal to zero here. And uh, it's going to be minus the value of the original random variable. Uh, whenever the original random variable is negative. So this is our X minus function. And uh, yeah, so hopefully from the picture, it's clear that both X plus and X minus are non-negative random variables. For, so for the green function and the gray function, uh, we have already defined expectation. We are going to take advantage of that, and uh, this will be our definition of expectation. Um, yeah, ho hopefully the picture is clear. 
Uh, formula, uh, formula, you can say that uh, x plus, the functional values of x plus are going to be the greater of x of omega and zero. The functional values of x minus are going to be the greater of minus x of omega and zero. So this is our green function, this is our gray function. And uh, x itself is the difference between them. And because we said that expectation should be a linear concept, a linear operator, uh, we are going to define the expectation of a random variable x as the difference of the expectation of x plus and the expectation of x minus. So basically we take this equation here and we postulate that with the expectation operator present, uh, yeah, it still looks the same. Uh, now, the expectation of x plus or the expectation of x minus potentially could be plus infinity. That is, the supremum that we talked about previously does not have to be a real number. It can be plus infinity. And uh, if both of these are equal to plus infinity, then in the definition you would get a difference of infinity. So infinity minus infinity. That's something that we typically do not define, right? So we would just say this is undefined. And uh, if you encounter this kind of situation, you just say that the random variable does not have an expectation. For the Cauchy distribution, for example, this would be exactly the case. So the expected value of x plus would be infinity. The expected value of x minus would be infinity. And for that reason, you don't say um, that uh, the Cauchy distribution has any particular expectation. The expectation is uh, going to be uh, not defined. Uh, all right, so I completed these different steps here uh, of the definition. Uh, any questions right now? If you found it a little bit uh, tedious and complicated, then don't worry. So you don't need to use these particular definitions for actual computation of uh, the expectations. When we need to compute expectations, we will be able to translate everything into some summations or integration and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, for conceptual clarity, I wanted to walk you through these definitions here. And then a uh, question, I suppose this way of defining expectation is going to be more inclusive in definition than the integral definition, but I still don't know uh, where it is the case. Uh, I mean, in which cases does it help? Uh, does it help us to keep a meaningful definition of expectation? And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we are going to use this concept and uh, the underlying definition to make our life easier, right? Uh, previously, when we wanted to define expectation and the moments and stuff like that, we always had to be clear. So is this going to be a discrete random variable? Is this going to be a continuous random variable? And depending on the situation, uh, we would have to use different formulas. Uh, here we have a universal definition. If you use this definition, you can actually prove that in the case of discrete random variables, uh, the, the definition is going to reduce to whatever we had previously and similarly, uh, for the continuous case. Uh, so of course you can have these uh, mixed distributions and uh, even more complicated distributions. And uh, if we had to like uh, specify every single time all of this when we talk about uh, statistics theorems, it would be a headache, right? Uh, we would just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over. Uh, so to avoid that, uh, we have this powerful definition of expectation. If we use that, uh, we will be just fine and we don't have to worry about uh, discrete versus continuous versus uh, some mixture of those and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, talk here also about some connection to measure theory. And uh, it is something that I wanted to cover at least a little bit, uh, because when you then open statistics papers, uh, you will see concepts like measure and, and stuff like that. So I wouldn't want you to wonder what exactly that is. So I hope you don't mind staying a little bit longer. Uh, let me get there. And uh, yeah, so, so we spend some number of minutes going through the definition in here. 
uh, and I needed to explain this. Um, but think of it as an investment. So it's an investment of time. Uh, once we have this definition, then we can make things much easier going forward. Uh, we will not have some cumbersome formulations of theorems and stuff like that. And yeah, by the way, um, often it is the case that you don't know in advance before you solve some mathematical problem if some random variable is going to be discrete or continuous. So if you want to talk about that, then you actually are much better off uh, using this uh, more powerful definition. Uh, then, oh yeah, I have actually one more thing in here. So uh, notation. Uh, previously, I always called expectations or like I denoted expectations as E or E of X. Uh, but um, sometimes, actually quite often, you would see uh, you would see the expectation written in different form. Uh, at this moment, for us, uh, it's just a different kind of notation. Uh, so uh, we use uh, notation that looks like an integral. It is defined using our previous definition of expectation. So you can really think of it as just a couple of symbols uh, that denote whatever we already defined. And uh, in this notation, we write the expectation as like a formal integral uh, that includes the random variable that we are integrating uh, that, or that we are defi defining expectation of. And then we have this differential dp in here. And p, that stands for the probability measure. And there's a longer form of this same notation uh, where we have an integral yeah, the integral is kind of over different omegas, over the different outcomes. We have the functional values of uh, x in here. And uh, yeah, in this piece of notation, we have like the differential of p at point omega. Uh, so this is something to bring the notation closer to the usual notation of integrals. But uh, really think of this definition, uh, think, think of these uh, symbols on the right hand side as being defined using the definition that we just talked about. Uh, all right, uh, yeah, so, so unfortunately I, I didn't have that much time. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope you don't mind staying. Uh, so one more comment, uh, one more comment on measures. It may be that I will have to come back to this a little bit uh, the next time. Uh, but uh, let me say that uh, so far we talked about uh, probability theory and we had a lot of these different axioms. Uh, hopefully you remember uh, that we had these axioms for the probability space and that included uh, defining the sample space and uh, events and the probability measure. Uh, it turns out that you, you can take the same set of ideas and just modify the, art, modify the axioms a little bit. And then you will get uh, other useful mathematical objects. So uh, instead of uh, probability measure, uh, we can define measure in general. How are we going to do that? Uh, we are going to relax one of the axioms of uh, probability theory. Uh, in the case of probabilities, uh, we would uh, specify that the measure of the whole of the whole space, of the whole sample space, is equal to one, because one of the outcomes had to happen. The probability that some outcome happens is 100%. So if you make that modification, uh, then instead of uh, probability measure, uh, you would be defining measure in general. And uh, these measures can come in many different flavors. I wanted to uh, discuss today so-called counting measure and uh, Lebesgue measure. I will try to hurry up a little bit, but uh, yeah, if, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me. Uh, why would we want to define this? Uh, because uh, we would like to be able to conveniently translate these statistics concepts into sums and integrals, and the translation into sums uh, is easy using the counting measure. Uh, the translation into integrals is easy using the Lebesgue measure. Now, uh, yeah, by the way, uh, we could spend, uh, uh, we can spend like half a year talking just about measure theory. Uh, so if this is a little bit too quick, um, my apologies, I just uh, want to give you some flavor of all of this. 
It's not our main focus, it's just some technicalities that uh, I would like to define um, for our equations to have some solid mathematical grounding. Uh, but uh, it's not really something that you have to worry about uh, way too much. Uh, all right, uh, so I would like to define a counting measure. Uh, in general, a measure is going to be some number assigned to a set. And uh, this counting measure is going to be uh, some number, uh, we are going to call it new, that's going to be assigned to some set A. And uh, yeah, the measure is going to be specific to some particular set, like, uh, yeah, let's, let's call this set omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. Uh, it can be countably infinite, so it can be an inf infinite sequence here. It can be a finite set. So basically, uh, this is uh, some interesting omegas that are on your mind. And you would like to define counting measure associated with these particular values. Uh, yeah, what is that going to be? Uh, the, the definition is in here. So the counting measure new uh, for this particular set A, actually any set that you, that's on your mind, that's going to be the number of different omegas uh, in this set that actually belong to A. That is, uh, uh, we have some very special omegas that are on our mind. Uh, for these, we are going to define measure new. And uh, anytime someone gives you a set A, you will say that the measure associated with that set is the number of omegas that belong to that uh, set A. Um, yeah, may maybe it sounds a little bit cumbersome, but uh, let me give you a quick example. Uh, let's say that you have this particular set and then uh, you want to uh, define the counting measure associated with that. Uh, so the counting measure associated, uh, yeah, the, the counting measure for an interval from 10 to 20, uh, that's going to be zero because between 10 and 20, you don't see any of these points. Uh, the counting measure, this particular counting measure for an interval from minus 10 to minus five, that's going to be equal to one because in this particular interval, uh, one number from your special set uh, is in there. So uh, yeah, this one is in this range, so the counting measure is one and so on and so on. If you have a big interval, say from minus 10 uh, to plus seven, uh, then all of these numbers are included and the counting measure is going to be equal to three. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, the counting measure really is the number of these special elements that belong to the particular set that you specified. And, uh, uh, yeah, we will, yeah, we can use this counting measure to also define something that looks like an integral uh, in our notation. Uh, it will look like an integral. But uh, really, what I have on the left-hand side is going to be defined by what I have on the right-hand side. Uh, specifically, if you have some random variable capital X and you would like to define its uh, integral using this counting measure over some set S in here, uh, sorry, uh, then... Uh, uh, you are going to sum up the values of x over the different omegas that both belong to s and that belong to this uh, set of omegas. Um, that is, uh, yeah, if you were to define an integral of some random variable capital X uh, with this counting measure associated with this particular set, over a particular interval, uh, yeah, let's say interval from minus 10 to three, uh, what you would do is you would look up the values of omega from the set that belong to that interval. Uh, right here, it would be these two values. Then you would look up the functional values of x in there. That will be these x omegas. And then you would sum it. So in this particular case, you would have 
uh, the sum of two elements. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm going a little bit uh, too fast in here because I didn't have that much time. So that's the counting measure. I'm definitely happy to answer questions. And uh, yeah, before we finish today, I wanted to also mention this Lebesgue measure. Uh, that's something that uh, you may have seen in your calculus class. Uh, the Lebesgue measure would often be defined using, uh, would be often denoted using this uh, letter mu. And uh, it's supposed to be just uh, corresponding to our intuitive notion of length or area or uh, stuff like that. So in particular, if you have an open interval uh, from A to B, uh, the measure, the, the Lebesgue measure associated with that is going to be B minus A. So like a really the length of the interval. Uh, yeah, the Lebesgue measure satisfies the same axioms as the probability measure, except that uh, yeah, except that the one axiom that we can relax and we replace that axiom with this one. So our axiom for the Lebesgue measure is going to be, if you have an interval from A to B, uh, then the length of the interval is going to be its uh, Lebesgue measure. And uh, yeah, then you can also speak of the associated uh, Lebesgue integral. Uh, it can be denoted like this uh, with the mu in there. It can be also denoted like this where you don't write mu explicitly because that's what you have in mind implicitly. Uh, if you have an integral over a finite interval uh, or yeah, uh, any interval from A to B, then you would use uh, this kind of notation. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, you would... Uh, uh, define these integrals in a way that's actually very, very uh, closely related to the definition of expectations that we went through. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you did, ta did take uh, advanced calculus and if you did take uh, the theory of uh, Lebesgue measures or Lebesgue integration, then you have probably seen that. Uh, I will not have uh, that, that much time to elaborate on that. Uh, I just wanted to bring this to your attention that... Uh, yeah, there can be these different measures. They can be the counting measure. They can be the uh, Lebesgue measure. And uh, if you are computing integrals using uh, using the Lebesgue measure, it corresponds to the usual rules of integration that you probably uh, learned in your uh, calculus class. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe it was uh, too too much today, and uh, unfortunately, I was a little bit slower than I expected. If this is uh, way too much material, if it's uh, a little bit complicated, uh, then don't worry, right? So uh, going forward, uh, when we discuss some subject, we will discuss it in the context of uh, uh, discrete random variables and continuous random variables. Uh, but for those of you who don't mind uh, thinking about these more advanced mathematical concepts, I wanted to cover this to some extent. Uh, so that uh, you can use this more advanced notation and uh, yeah, you would be able to uh, use uh, measures and stuff like that in the different theorems and computations um, and so on. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to cover today. And uh, the, next time, uh, the next time we should really uh, make some progress on defining uh, dependencies between random variables. So it will be using these different concepts. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, uh, we will have some more intuitive approach to everything. And But at the same time, I would also want to present the formulas uh, that use these more advanced mathematical concepts for those of you who are comfortable with that and who don't mind. Uh, yeah, question, how much uh, will we need these uh, theories in the next classes? And uh, yeah, let me say that to understand the core concepts, to understand the core intuition, you will not need that. So if this was too much, don't worry about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, some of you, uh, some of you may be uh, more... Uh, theoretically oriented, uh, some of you may not mind, and uh, you may want to see uh, these different formulas using the advanced notation. Uh, so yeah, going forward, uh, 
I will definitely explain everything in intuitive terms that do not really require all of this, uh, but uh, your life will be easier if you understand all of it. Uh, okay, uh, uh, comment, uh, loved it. It ties it nicely with a class I'm taking on random processes. Uh, yeah, indeed. So if you take some of these uh, more advanced classes, random processes, like uh, time series, uh, and stuff like that, it's actually much easier if you are comfortable with these different concepts. Um, uh, but uh, again, uh, if you are more practically oriented, if you just want to understand things intuitively, I hope this particular session did not discourage you. Um, definitely anything that we will discuss in the future is going to be accessible without all of these advanced mathematical notions. And yeah, we will talk about dependence of random variables and intuition and uh, paradoxes and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff to cover in the future. Um, I hope you can join us uh, one week from now and uh, two weeks from now, we will be discussing the dependence of uh, random variables. And yeah, I will utilize the concepts we covered today, uh, but again, uh, don't worry if it's a little bit too much. Uh, all right, any, any other questions? Uh, great. Yeah, so uh, it's great you were a good join. Uh, thanks a lot and see you next time.